With that, I'm going to go ahead and get started um, because our numbers are beginning to kind of even out. Um, but thank you so much for being with us this evening. Uh, you are here tonight for the College Admissions Parent Orientation. So this webinar is exclusively for you, the parents um, of our district. Uh, most of you are probably high school parents, right? Um, but tonight we'll be talking about all things college admissions so that you can get a head start on um, helping your student as they move through their college planning journey. So before we get started, a couple housekeeping items for you. Um, if you see the chain link icon on the screen at any point during tonight's presentation, that means that there is a linked resource on the page for you. So after tonight, I will be sending everybody a copy of the slides as well as a link to the recording. And if you see this in the copy of the slides, if you click on the link next to it, you'll be able to access a resource that we have linked for you. Um, and again, this uh, recording will be available to you after tonight's um, presentation and it will be posted on our YouTube channel. Uh, we ask you to please use the Q&A function. So uh, you'll see on your screen this, this icon, it says Q&A. We do ask that if you have a question that you use the Q&A button as opposed to sending your question through the chat. Um, as people start sending messages in the chat, it can get very congested and it will be hard for us to monitor your questions. And we wanna make sure to answer your questions. Um, please note that we'll probably end up answering a lot of your questions as we move along tonight. Um, so, you know, if you want to wait until the end to ask a question, you're welcome to do that. Um, and just know that we will have a, a again, a Q&A session at the end to answer a lot of your questions. Uh, again, this webinar is being recorded. Your mic is off, your camera is off. You're just here to listen to us. We will post this on our YouTube channel after tonight. And then finally, I do have an ask for all of you in here. We do provide interpretation services. So tonight we do have a translator with us, Ms. Claudia Ortega from the district. I am gonna ask right now, um, to, to see if anybody in here needs interpretation. What I'm gonna do is in the chat box, it's anonymous or it's it's only to me, the host, so nobody can see your chat but me. But if you need translation, translation services, can you please just type um, into the chat box, yes. So if you need translation into Spanish right now, if you could just type yes in the chat box to let us know. And if not, then we can move on. And Ms. Ortega, I'm not seeing any responses in the chat at this time, okay? Just to let you know. All right, thank you so much for that. Okay, my friends, let's go ahead and move on. Uh, so Futurology, who are we? If you're in here, you probably know who we are by now. Um, but Futurology is Capistrano Unified School District's free college and career counseling program. We are a team of now seven college and career counselors, if you can believe that. If you've been here for a, you know, a couple years, you know how much our team has grown in the past few years. And that's because we're doing a great job and we're here to support all of you. And that there is now one of us at every single high school throughout the district, including a college and career counselor for all our, our alternative programs, um, Cal Prep and Union High School as well. So we are here to support your children in all areas of college and career exploration. We are credentialed high school counselors, credentialed school counselors, excuse me. Um, but in addition to that, we're experts in college admissions. Uh, most of our team has experience uh, in, in college admissions reading. So most of us have worked for the UCs. Uh, currently right now on our team, we have a UCI admissions reader, a UC Berkeley admissions reader, a UCLA admissions reader, and a UC Santa Barbara admissions reader. Um, so we come to you through that lens and we come to our work through that lens as well so that we can advise your students to the best of our ability. And of course, we're data driven. So everything we do is based on the needs of the students and the families in our district. We're always making sure that what we provide to you is what you've asked for and what we see as a need in our district based on the data that we're seeing. We offer college and career counseling appointments. We offer workshops during school and after school, presentations during your students' tutorial periods at school. Uh, we offer webinars exactly like this one throughout the school year, typically one a month, right, for all of the families in our district. We are supporting our schools with their college um, 
school-wide initiatives. And we are here to provide classroom lessons. We have bilingual support. We have three Spanish-speaking counselors on our team. Um, so we are here to deliver college and career counseling to your students uh, in every way that we possibly can. Um, so you can find us uh, in the College and Career Counseling um, Center at the uh, at your high school site. So we're all located in different areas, but we're all on site full time every single day, Monday through Friday in the College and Career Center. So look for us there if you have any questions. So moving into tonight's presenters, um, I will be presenting to you tonight along with my amazing co-host, Ms. Brianne Boyle. Um, I'm with CUSD Futurology. I'm one of the counselors. I've been here since 2019. This is my 15th year as a counselor. Um, I'm currently an executive board member with the Western Association for College Admission Counseling, and I was a former UCI admissions reader. So this is what I'm coming to my work with, right, was with that experience. Um, Brianne is coming to us as the president and uh, president primary college advisor at BB College Prep, uh, past president of the Western Association for College Admission Counseling, and currently an, an instructor through UCLA's extension program. And Brianne is a wealth of knowledge in all things college admissions. So I'm so happy to have her with me tonight. And you'll be hearing a lot from her um, as we enter into discussing the state of college admissions. So let's talk about tonight's agenda. It's packed. There's a lot of things that we're going to cover, okay? Um, so tonight, we're going to be talking about the college planning timeline so that you get a sense of generally what each student should be focusing on based on their grade level, right? Just so that you have a sense of, you know, what should my students be focusing on if they're in ninth, 10th, 11th, or 12th grade? We're going to talk about pathways to college and what options your students have to enter into the university system from high school. We'll talk about the state of college admissions uh, in the U.S., right? And then we'll talk about admissions factors, what goes into um, deciding whether or not a student is selected for college admissions, um, and what are some of the important factors that we're seeing uh, across the nation. We'll talk about testing. I'm sure you have a lot of questions about that. College fit factors and how they are an important and integral part in your student's college search process, exploration tools, an application timeline for our senior families, and parent role, of course, this is for you, and then, of, of course, a QA and a at the end. So why are we here tonight, right? Something drove you as a parent here tonight to, um, to listen in on what college admission is all about. Something, um, you know, inspired you to sign up for this webinar. Um, so I'd like to ask you um, in a poll, let me activate this poll here. So um, as you're kind of thinking about your child's college and career journey, right, I want you to tell me what some of your concerns are as you're supporting your child through this journey. Um, and you can select more than one option, but I'd like to get a sense of what some of our fears and anxieties are. Um, sometimes we're driven to things like this out of fear and anxiety, right? Um, or maybe it's pure excitement. Um, but I'd love to get a sense of what your, your biggest concerns are as you're supporting your child. Thank you so much for your responses. I see them coming in. You can choose more than one if you'd like. But I'm going to give you a second to kind of think about that. And then I'd like to publish this poll so that everybody can take a look, right? Your answers are anonymous, but I just want to get a sense of what's going on in here and, and what's driving us here tonight, right? <clears throat> so I'll go ahead and end this poll. <clears throat> Most of you are responding. Thank you so much for that. I'll end this poll in five, four, three, two, and one. Beautiful. So let's take a look at the results, okay? So... For most of us, the concern is finding a best fit college for your student, right? How am I going to find a college that's going to fit my student based on their individual and unique needs? Um, that makes sense. 75% of the responses was that, right? I think second place is looking like understanding the application timeline, which we'll talk about as well. Uh, and then finally, paying for college is always a big one. It's usually in the top three, which it is tonight. And then career and major exploration. Wonderful. For those of you who chose other, I'd love to see you know, what those other concerns are, you're welcome to put it that in the chat box for us to see as presenters. Um, but we'll definitely be addressing some of these concerns tonight. Okay, so thank you for, for sharing that with me. Actually, um, one more question for you, just because I, I would like to know, 
what grade is your student in? I want to get a sense of our, our crowd tonight so that I know who I'm speaking to so we can tailor it a little bit more to you. And we have a lot of parents of juniors. Okay. Beautiful. All right. This is really good timing. It's good timing for everybody. I think this information will be pertinent to all of you, no matter what grade your child is in. Um, but as you can see, we have a majority of juniors in here tonight. I love it. Okay. Well, thank you so much for that. Let's go ahead and move on to the college planning timeline, okay? So a lot of us, I, we have a couple families in here who are um, middle school families, right? Um, so that we're, some of us are really kind of eager to learn about this and to start talking about college right away. So let's talk about our ninth and 10th graders and what college planning looks like for a freshman and a sophomore in high school. First of all, it's really important for our ninth and 10th grade families to understand that there are some basic things that need to be established before we really dive into searching for colleges, right? One of the primary things that we want our ninth and 10th graders, especially our ninth graders to understand coming into high school are the A through G requirements. Um, you know, I just kind of think to yourself right now, do I know what the A through G requirements are? Does my student know what the A through G requirements are? The A through G requirements are subject requirements that are um that students have to fulfill in order to apply to a UC or a Cal State in the state of California. So they're um literally subject requirements that students have to fulfill throughout high school with a grade of C or higher in order to be eligible to apply to a UC or a Cal State. The beauty of the A through G requirements is by fulfilling um, the requirements throughout high school, students are also making themselves competitive for all sorts of other universities uh, and colleges out there uh, in the state and as well as the rest of the country. So it's a great um, it's a great framework to use as you're thinking about what courses your students should take throughout high school. Uh, admissions awareness is important for ninth and 10th graders. This is a shift that our team is kind of taking um, uh, towards educating ninth and 10th graders on college admissions, right? While we don't think that ninth and 10th graders should be making college lists, right? And doing that kind of research, it is important for ninth and 10th graders to understand what goes into the admissions process so that they can plan accordingly at the beginning. So that in the beginning of high school, they understand what is um, factored into admission so that they can take the appropriate courses and start exploring their interests in a meaningful way, right? Um, so we do think that that is important and there will be some upcoming webinars in the spring for our underclassmen to really explore admissions in more depth so that they can begin um, building their overall profile and exploring their interests and you know, trying really hard in school. We want our ninth and 10th graders to explore their interests. This is the bulk of what ninth and 10th graders should be doing is exploring what they love, exploring what they're curious about through clubs and through um, summer courses and through assessments in the college and career center with us, right? Um, with their career guidance specialists who are also in the college and career center. Um, but this is a great time for students to explore so that they can begin narrowing down um, areas of interest, which will then help them find colleges eventually that offer programs in those areas, right? Um, so the self-exploration part is very uh, important at that ninth and 10th grade level. And then of course, study skills, self-advocacy, time management, these are skills that we're developing over time, um, especially in those first couple of years of high school. So we want them to become, um, you know, agents of their own time in their future. Um, we're encouraging them to email their teachers independently for support. We're encouraging them to learn how to communicate with their counselors and their peers and their teachers, because by the time senior year rolls around, we want them to take charge of that application process independently as much as possible. Now for 11th grade, it's a lot of the same, right? It's maintaining those courses. It's continued career and major exploration, which they can do again with their counselor with us in the College and Career Center. Um, but then we also begin the uh, process of exploring colleges, of building our college list, of finding that best fit college, right? Um, I can assure you that our team will be offering a lot of support for our ninth, 10th, and 11th graders going into spring semester so that they begin that exploration process. So rest assured that they will have that support at school. Um, but junior year is really when our, our students begin to search for colleges and build their list. Um, and they begin prepping for essays by the end of 11th grade going into 12th grade. And again, our team will be hosting um, an essay building workshop after school ends, I think we'll be offering a summer uh, essay workshop for our juniors. And then finally, by 12th grade, 
we have our college list completed, we're completing essays, we're submitting applications, we're applying for financial aid, and we are submitting an intent to register by May 1st. That's what SIR means, okay? More on that a little bit later. The senior year, all of that work that was put in between ninth and 11th grade culminates in actually applying to those colleges that are your best fit colleges, right? So this is the timeline for most of our high school students. Um, so just something to think about as you're supporting your student through that process. Now let's talk about some pathways to a four-year college. And these are just a few, right? There are many other pathways a student can take, but these are three that we see often with our students. So let's start with them. So first of all, um, the most, you know, popular, um, I guess, pathway in, I guess, our kind of social consciousness is going directly to college from high school, right? That's what um, I'm sure all of you are hoping for your students is that they're going to graduate from Capistrano Unified School District, and they're going to go directly into a four-year university. That's a lot. Um, that's what a lot of our students hope to do. This is great for students who know what they want to do. They have a strong sense of what they want to major in. Maybe they know they want to pursue graduate education because they want to go to a, a professional school. They want to become a lawyer or a, you know, a physician or something along those lines. Then it's great because they're not wasting any time. They're getting in there. They know what they want to study. They know where they want to go. And one of the benefits is this immediate entry into college life, right? That immediate access to the social benefits of being at a university. And that's really important for a lot of students. Um, and that's what drives a lot of this is I want to go to college. I want to be in that environment um, and socializing and growing uh, right away right? But that is not the only way that our students can make it into a four-year college or a university, right? Transfer is incredibly popular uh, in our district. You'll see that in the next slide that I'll share with you. Um, but transferring is an excellent option uh, and a great pathway into a four-year college. That involves going to a community college for freshman and sophomore year and transferring to a university for junior and senior year. Um, this is great for students who are not ready to transition into university life yet. You know your students very well. Maybe they don't feel mature enough or maybe you think that they're not mature enough to go straight into university life, right? This is a great time for students to kind of slowly transition from a campus larger than their high school but smaller than a university and gives them time to kind of plan things out and prepare. It's time Time to gain maturity. Like I said, it's time to save money. The California Promise Program um, provides free tuition for all first-time college freshmen at our local community colleges. So it would be free, right? We'd have two years uh, of zero dollars for college where you're saving money. Also great for students who might want to pursue med school, law school, right? Graduate school, when we know we're going to be spending more money on the tail end with furthering our education, starting off at a community college is a great cost savings. Um, so something that a lot of our families take into consideration as well. And finally, a transfer route is great for a second chance at our dream school. So let's say our students apply and they don't get into our, their dream school. Transferring gives them that second chance because when you transfer, you're a college student transferring to another college, right? And so if our students find that they're not currently competitive for their dream school or they don't get into their dream school, a community college is a great way to um, try again and to see if they can get access to that university um, by doing the best they can as a college freshman and sophomore at their local community college. Finally, another pathway into a four-year college is the gap year. Um, I've been working with students increasingly who are interested in taking a gap year. It's been it's becoming more popular in our district. Um, in my experience, right? That's anecdotal. Um, I don't have the data to prove that, but um, it's just what I'm observing, right? So a gap year is when a student takes off time between graduating from high school and attending college. And a gap year is can be great for many different reasons, right? A gap year can really be helpful if a student is one, totally burnt out. Maybe they just worked really hard and they're just really tired and they need some time to take a break, to re, um, just kind of reassess everything and just think about what they wanna do before they apply to college, right? And they can, they can take that time. Um, it's great for students who wish to pursue an interest or travel the world or do something where they're learning something, right? A gap year is best when a student is being productive during that time. 
Um, it's when they are working because they want to earn money or they're traveling or um, they're, you know, on a mission to with their church, right? Traveling across the country. Um, it's great for students, again, who want time to work on something else that isn't tied to school necessarily. And during that time, they're gaining maturity, they're gaining life experience um, that could then add value to their college application as well, right? Um, so something that they can consider if they if they feel like they have the maturity to do so and that they have something meaningful to do during that time. Um, of course, other options would be to join the military and then to apply to a university, to join the workforce and then apply to a university, right? So we have a lot of options and our students utilize all of these different pathways to get to a four-year college. So let's talk about data from our district specifically. Okay, so this is Capistrano Unified School District College Admissions data for the class of 2022. Um, I get these questions a lot, so I figured we would include this for tonight so that you get your questions answered. Okay, so first of all, top 10 colleges attended by our students from Capistrano Unified School District. These are the top 10. And this is between the classes of 2015 to the class of 2022, um, when we compiled the number, the sheer volume of students in enrolling in these institutions. These are our top 10 colleges. What is number one? Saddleback College. What is number four? Irvine Valley College, right? You'll see in our top five are two community colleges. Um, so you can see right away that that transfer pathway is incredibly popular with our school district. It is the, um, the number one option, right? Cal Poly Slow, number two, San Diego State. This probably doesn't surprise a lot of you, right? Cal State Fullerton, a lot of our local Cal States. And then UCLA, UC Irvine, UC Santa Barbara, ASU, and BYU. Um, so if you want more information on this, you're welcome to reach out to any of us. We have this data to share with you, but I thought you'd want to know where our students are going when they graduate. Secondly, who's attending college, right? Who's enrolling in college immediately after graduating from high school? So for the class of 2022, 75% of our uh, district graduates attended college in the fall immediately following graduation. So we are a college going district. 75% is no joke, right? That's most of our students. Um, so the majority of our students are going to college after they graduate from high school immediately after, so that fall. And then finally, where did they enroll? So 65% of our students are going off to public universities. So that's the Cal States, the UCs, um, our community colleges, right? Um, that also counts out-of-state public institutions as well. Um, and then 11% are going to private schools. 41% are going to a four-year. 34% are going to a two-year. So a huge chunk of our students, a third of our students are going to a community college. And then about more than half of our students are staying in the state of California. And uh, less than a quarter are going out of state. Okay, so just to get a sense of, you know, where our students are going, it's so diverse, our students are going everywhere. I'm so proud to be working for a district where, you know, this is the culture of our, our students and our families, right, is that higher education is important, and they're going everywhere between Saddleback and SLO and BYU, right, and so many other schools. Um, this is a priority for our district. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pass this on to Brianne, who really is my favorite part of tonight, and she's going to tell you all about the state of college admissions, but she's first going to address what selectivity is in college admissions. Yes. Hi. I'm so glad to be here. I'm always so happy to talk to um, Capo families, so thanks for having me continuously. Um, so I, I've i been doing this for a long time. I've been, I mean, about 13 years that I've been working with students as an independent counselor. So I do work with students individually and help them through this process. Um, so I've worked with uh, probably close to 500 students at this point, uh, most of which are in the Orange County area. And I'm very happy to say most of which have come from the school district. So very familiar with what you guys are doing. Well, let's talk about college selectivity. Um, another way to kind of look at that, like, is acceptance rate. So you'll hear admit rate or acceptance rate. Um, so the schools that have the lower acceptance rates are considered selective or highly selective schools. So that'll kind of range. Um, so let's um, so let's talk about that a little bit before we dive into some of the numbers. So I, I like to tell people that a good way to think about this is there's about 2,500 colleges in the United States, give or take. Um, about 100 colleges are considered selective, which I would say would be below 50% admit rate. If a school is only admitting half or fewer students than apply, that's a selective institution. Their chances of getting in are less than they are um, 
to be denied. So that would be, there's about a hundred or so of those. And there's about 40 or so that are 20% or below in acceptance rate. So those would be what I would call highly selective. Um, but most of the colleges in the United States are accepting 65% or more of the students who apply, which means they're accepting more than they're denying. So that is good news in college admissions. Um, so let's drill down into some of these numbers here. Um, so I won't read you all of these numbers, but I think it's a good thing to look at to see what the average college acceptance rate. I mentioned that most colleges are at 65%, but as you can see, the average acceptance rate across the United States is closer to 73%. So that's including everything there. Now, if you look at the public versus private colleges, you'll see a little bit of a discrepancy there, a little change, but not a huge difference there. So I think sometimes people think private colleges are a little more selective just because they're private, but that's not the case. Um, and then you'll see that per institution, the number of applications that um, colleges are admitting, a little, a little over 7,000, about 7,500 on average applicants. And then you can see the number of apps that they're receiving. So that's, you can kind of compare there, like how many are they getting and how many are they admitting public versus private? Now, I wanna add a little bit more data in there for you to compare. You see these numbers and you think, oh my gosh, that's not that many. <laughs> 7,000 kids they're admitting, you know, 13,000 applications. However, some colleges are different. So the UC system gets a huge number of applications. And I have some numbers for you that I looked up that were just reported by the UCs this year. So for example, Berkeley received 125,000 applications this year. Um, UCLA received 146,000 applications. And unless someone corrects me, I believe they are still considered the school that gets the most applications in the United States is UCLA. Um, so for a little bit of a difference in UCs, Davis gets about not, got about 95,000 applications this year. And by this year, I mean this past application cycle, not this fall. They're still receiving applications this week. So we'll learn those numbers next fall. Um, and then UCI, to be in our backyard here, about 121,000 applications. Now, um, their admit rates are all significantly lower than 73%. But I wanted to just give that to you as an example compared to most colleges, because sometimes the UCs operate in their own world. They have different numbers. Um, they get a mu much higher volume of applications. So they're a little bit tougher to compare to um, the other schools we're talking about. So with that, um, I, we do have a cool little scattergram for you. So this is an example of all the colleges, right, in the United States. Obviously, there's not one dot for every single school, but you can kind of see, right, how they're placed. You can obviously see that it's catching most of the big state schools. There's more colleges where there's more population generally that kind of flows that way. So these are all the colleges, like I said, 2,500 to 3,000, depending on the number you're looking at. Um, and plenty of those admit most of the people who apply. Now, in comparison, look at this next map. So colleges with an acceptance rate of less than 40%, which would be considered a selective school, right? That's less than half of the people who apply. But I think the good news here is see how small the dots are. There are so many fewer dots here than there were in the last map. So you can see that it's not the majority of the colleges in the United States. It's a small group of them. Um, and I think sometimes it feels like college admissions is only this story. You know, students aren't getting in. I heard a valedictorian at another school didn't get in. And I think you need to start thinking about what the follow-up questions are when you hear stories like that, which are, where did they apply? So if you hear like, oh my gosh, students aren't getting in anywhere. And the schools that they're applying to are only super selective colleges and every UC, which are selective, then that's not a balanced college list. So of course, they're not gonna have a huge list of schools that they were admitted to. The problem is most of the media, most of the college admissions world, you know, families, the stressful stories you're gonna hear during the holidays are all gonna be about these little dots you see on this map. So these, you know, whatever it is, 40 or 50 colleges, people are gonna be talking about those schools and that feels like the whole story. But the good news is the whole story really is much more positive. There are plenty of colleges admitting more. Yes, there's the example. <laughs> see how many more dots there are? All right, so let's talk about what our college is looking for. We talked about selectivity, which is an important piece of this, but now you're applying. So what are the things that colleges are using to review the application? So according to the data, and you can see um, V has put on there that we're getting this from the National Association for College Admission Counseling, um, which pulls data um, every couple of years so that we have the most up-to-date information on what colleges are using to review your students. So um, this is the most up-to-date information. The thing that colleges are reporting that they're looking at uh, 
the most are grades. So grades that students are getting in their college prep courses. So, you know, not like your sports. <laughs> We're talking about college prep courses, the grades that you're getting into them, um, all of the grades in all of your high school courses. You'll hear that people will say things like ninth grade doesn't count, but what it is is that some colleges will look at certain grades or certain um, years in high school more than other years. And you'll hear that said a lot because the UCs only use the 10th and 11th grade to factor their GPA. But the reality is that colleges are looking at all four years or all the grades that are on your transcript. And they're looking at the trend of grades as well. So um, the most important piece is always academics. You're gonna go to college to study something, right? <laughs> so it makes sense that they're looking at your academics first. So what grades are you getting? And then what classes are you taking? What is the strength of the curriculum that you have offered to you and that you are taking? So colleges will look at you in the context of your high school. What does your high school offer? And then what did you take advantage of? And every student is different. So please understand, I am not telling you, you need to go out and sign up for every AP course that your high school offers, unless that sounds like a real fun time for you and will be easy, then have at it. But for some students, that might mean taking one or two honors classes a year, or taking you know, five or six honors classes total through high school, maybe taking a third or a fourth year in a language. So they wanna see that you're doing more than what is the minimum requirement. So if you look at those A through G requirements, you'll see that they'll say, okay, we want two years of a foreign language required, three preferred. So taking that third or that fourth year is still showing rigor. So you'll see that colleges still look at that. Um, and that also includes things like college, community college courses um, as well. Okay, so then let's look at the other pieces of the, the pie here. Um, every student is different. And you have to do what works for you. So while you're balancing your academics, the other piece that colleges will look at is your character or the things that you're doing. What makes you you? How are you different from other people in the applicant pool? The ways they can tell those things are looking at your essays. What are you writing about? What are you telling them? What are the activities you've been involved in? You know, What are the things that you have that you're passionate about? Um, they'll learn those things in the essays. They'll learn those things in your letters of recommendation, which will come from your teachers um, and your counselor. They'll learn about that in the extracurricular activities that you participate in. What are the things you love to do? Do the things that you're passionate about and you're excited about. And let me tell you a little tip about extracurricular stuff. Do the things you love. Um, it's great to do stuff because you think it's helpful and great for the community, but make sure you're doing things you're actually passionate about because when you write your descriptions on those applications, I can tell you having read hundreds and hundreds of applications as probably many of the futurology folks can tell you as well, you can tell the difference when someone does an activity they're really excited about and really you know, pumped to go do than someone who just showed up to kind of get a few community service hours. So you know, try to find something in there that you really like to do um, and then follow that passion. The other thing is that essay, the essay is really gonna show you, um, show them an aspect of you that they aren't gonna find in the application. So this is where you might tell a story about, you know, your family or your culture or how you were raised or whatever, that is something that they aren't gonna see elsewhere that lets them understand who you are as an individual. So those are the pieces and that's kind of the order. You can see we've put the percentages there for the um, colleges that reported that they consider these things in importance. Um, I will say that you can tell when colleges only care about the academic piece. There are some like that, like Cal State's are one because they'll only ask you about the academics. So it's pretty obvious to know which ones are gonna look at those, those other pieces. So let's talk about testing, which is obviously everything you were waiting for and the most exciting topic tonight, <laughs> standardized tests. So um, we are talking about SAT, ACT, and to some degree, you know, AP, IB, but um, it does not matter which tests you take. Colleges will accept either SAT or ACT. They want you to take the one that you're strongest in. Um, a lot of colleges, in fact, most of them are still test optional in some capacity. So you can see we put that link on there, fairtest.org. You can go to that website and look up to see which colleges are test optional. What that means is that you can choose to send in a test score, SAT or ACT, if you want to, um, when you are applying to that school, if you think it fits your academic profile, which I'll talk about in a second. So um, that's what test optional means. They're giving you the option to send it in and they will review it if you want to. Now, there are some schools that are considered test blind or test free, which means that even if you wanted to send them, they won't look at them. Uh, biggest examples around here, the UCs and Cal States currently right now are test free. So you will not be able to send them test scores or have them review them, even if you wanted them to. 
Um, and you can find all that information on fairtest.org. They're really great about keeping up with which schools have which policies. So look at the colleges you're applying to and decide which tests are required. You know, some of the schools that you might be considering, maybe you have a whole list of test, op test optional schools and that might change how you do SAT or ACT. Um, but see what's required, what they're looking at, how they're reviewing them. See if that school is re using test scores for scholarships because some schools will say that they are test optional for admissions, but for scholarships, they do consider test scores. So they're, usually colleges are pretty clear about that on their website. If you look up their testing section um, on their website, they should outline that for you. And also Fair Test does a pretty good job of listing some of that. So um, testing, to test or not, are you good at testing? <laughs> if you're a great test taker and it doesn't stress you out, then test. Um, I'm advising most of the students that I'm working with to go ahead and at least take one test at least a practice test to just see where they're at and then take one official test. And the reason I'm advising that, by the way, is because the college list could morph and I don't want their college list to change and then they're applying to a school that requires tests and them to not have a test. So I'm still tell telling students to go out and take a test so you at least have one. But for some students, they aren't prepping or doing anything that's intense about that. Um, so decide whether or not you can take one, take a, a practice test, SAT or ACT, Honestly, the differences between them are um, not a lot anymore. I tell people it's like Coke or Pepsi. So two different brands, the tests are slightly different. Take a practice of each. Futurology has practice tests for you. So you can take those and determine which one to focus on. And then I would say only submit scores or apply to schools with scores if your test scores land in the middle 50% of where they're admitting which is easy to find. You can literally Google middle 50% SAT score and the name of the college, and you'll be able to find it. And if your score lands in there, then it's a good bet to send it in. Okay, all right. So how are colleges evaluating applicants? I mentioned this before that there's some schools that only look at academic stuff. And if, you, if they do, then you'll be able to see that. So Cal States are a good example where they're only looking at your grades. Tests are, are only considered for some of those schools, not for Cal States. Um, and then course rigor or the classes you're actually taking and how many you took of them, right? How many language, how many science, you know, did you push yourself? Um, they'll count the number of courses you've taken. Did you take college courses? That kind of thing. So some of them only look at that. It's pretty obvious when they do. Um, usually they're state schools. There's not necessarily a particular reason about that, but sometimes larger schools are only looking at academic index. Um, some of them will actually have a formula. The Cal States have one. There's an academic index you can look up for the Cal States. Now remember academic indexes, which is a formula to say whether you are admissible, it only means you are admissible, right? Or eligible. It doesn't mean that you will be admitted. It's not a guarantee of admission, but it'll tell you like, hey, if you're in this range, that's around where we admit, or that's where we know you're eligible for admission. Um, so they'll be looking at tests, course rigor, grades. Now, other schools will look at other things. They will consider the grades and the tests if they are um, considering that as part of it, your course rigor, just like we talked about, but they're also gonna look at extracurricular activities, those essays, those letters of recommendation, and sometimes an interview. There's not many colleges who do interviews, but that can be part of it. That's what we call a holistic review. They're looking at the entire person. They're looking at all of the pieces of who you are and giving it a holistic review of your application. So you'll be able to tell which ones are doing that because that'll be on the application. Um, so that part of that holistic review, that extracurricular college essays, all of that stuff, there's a piece of that that's important. So in our next slide, we talk about love of learning. So on the love of learning, um, think of that as like basically other stuff that you do. How are you showing a college that you are interested in learning? Because again, these are places of higher learning. They're education um, organizations. They want you to come there to learn. So how are you trying to, how are you gonna show them that that's something that you're interested in doing? It can be different for every student. So taking hard classes is a way to show a love of learning, but don't take them just to weight your GPA or make, make it look good, right? Maybe you take high, um, harder classes, APs or honors and only the subjects you're interested in, which is something that might show up later in your essays and things so they can kind of see this whole big picture of you. If you love history and English, take the harder classes in that. If you don't love those and you wanna take an AP class in chemistry because you love science, do that. Follow the things that you're interested in. So. Um, the colleges that are the most selective are going to be paying attention to this more. And you can usually tell because of the essay questions they ask. They are gonna ask you very specific questions about what are you doing for outside reading? 
what are research projects that you have done outside of school? And we're not talking about research projects like you did something for US history. They really are expecting that you've maybe done some research with a local college or a professor. And again, these are the most highly selective schools. Um, so some of them are gonna ask really specific questions to let you know that they're saying, we wanna find out from you, how much do you love learning? Because that's what they're looking for in the students that they admit. Um, but those can be different for other schools as well. So let's say we take all this, the crazy Ivy Leagues off the table, there are still schools who are gonna be looking for that. And you can do that by following your hobbies and your interests. You know, going and learning how to quilt or craft something is still showing that you like to learn new things. You're just, you like to learn creative things. Those are good skills to highlight. Um, if you like, you know, math, take a bunch of math stuff. If you like, um, you know, extra history courses or, or you're really into film, you can take courses like that at a community college just to expand your interest and show that love of learning. Um, I'll give an example of a student that I, I think is a good example of this that I'm working with right now. Um, she's majoring, she wants to major in business, but she is really into theater, um, really into the arts. And so she, that's what she's pursued in high school is really doing a lot of activities around that. And I think some parents would be concerned that it's not matching up to her major of interest, but that's okay because colleges are going to see that she's pursuing passions and things that she really enjoys. So she's been focused on, you know, getting involved with her theater department, helping to learn more about theater, the history of theater and all of that. So that's a student following something that they love, showing that love of learning in a way that might be different um, than just taking an extra class. So um, I have lots of examples, but that's that's a really good one to start. So uh, B, if you have more, feel free to add them in. Otherwise, I will toss it back over to you. Well, the minute you say essay and interesting essay questions, I always think that <laughs> you wanted one year when University of Chicago's one of their supplementals what's, was What's So Easy About Pi? Mm -hmm. All that. Yeah. So what's so easy about pie, right? Like such a harmless sounding question, but I mean, I think they're really digging for like the students who, you know, I don't know, might have something profound to say about that or something interesting or fun. Oh, yes. Say. Yeah. Uh -huh. University of Chicago also had an essay prompt that was just find X and that okay. was their prompt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. 500 words on that student. Right. So that's a, yeah, that's a great example, right? Like some of those really highly selected schools are gonna ask questions that are so pointed towards students who have really direct answers to like kind of nerding out about something. Um, and that isn't to say that, you know, other schools don't care about your love of learning, but you will be able to tell some are gonna be more pointed about it. Absolutely. Yeah, no, thank you. And I was thinking about another student as you were talking about examples of students who follow their passions that don't necessarily align always with their intended major. I worked with a student who got into Princeton and he uh, was applying as a chem major and did nothing related to chem in his entire four years of high school. He's the drum major. Um, he played violin and viola and his whole life was music and he clearly loved it and yep. dedicated every second he had to it. And I think he just was incredibly interesting in that regard um, because he followed it to the ends of the earth. Um, everything that he did within that kind of realm, I think just made him really impressive, you know? So yeah, I'm not to belabor this because I know, I know you have a million slides, but here's why that's a good example, right? If you have an admissions person who's reading an application and they're looking for students who love to learn and you say, here's a perfect example of someone who has followed a passion, learned instrument over instrument, has done this thing. Now take that same student with that ability and that passion, plop them into a major like chemistry or whatever it is that they're interested in. They know that that student is going to follow that major and that interest, if even if it's different from music. So, you know, it doesn't have to be an exact match to your major. They just want to see like, is that little kind of like nugget in there and, yeah. and then they can apply it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, don't get me wrong. He was academically very strong sure. uh, and <laughs> took all the sciences available to him and stuff like that. But like 100% agree. Yeah. I know we could do this all night, but okay. We're, we're moving on now. <laughs> okay. So, okay. So let's, let's transition now. So one of your top concerns when I pulled you earlier tonight was, um, your top, one of your top concerns was best college fit for my student. Like, how are we going to find that perfect fit? How are we going to, you know, pour over these 2,500 plus universities across the country? Um, so let's talk about this and, and start with this. So 64% of full-time undergraduate students graduate from college within six years. So that's coming from the National Center for Educational or Education Statistics, excuse me. So 64% of students are graduating from college within six years. 
that's usually the number that is reported is, is a six year graduation rate. Um, and every time I see this number, I wonder to myself, like, what is happening with that other 36% of students, right? What is going on that more than a third of students who are, you know, enrolling in college, why aren't they graduating? Um, and a big piece of this is that fit is incredibly important, right? For some reason, between that first year and whatever year they fell off, um, something happened in their educational journey. And oftentimes it comes back to fit and it comes back to a college that didn't meet that student's needs, right? And so fit is incredibly important. And a lot of times I find in my work, and I'm sure Pri Brianne can attest to this as well, as well as my colleagues here tonight, um, we are so obsessed with about 40 schools, right? We looked at that scattergram earlier and we saw that tiny smattering of um, schools that accepted less than 40% of students uh, across the country. And I think that's all we know. And that's all our students know, right? It's what their peers are talking about. It's what they see on TV and social media. Um, I mean, I it's, it's actually... I'm now immersed in it in my own social media. I keep getting videos of students saying like, this is what got me into Stanford, you know, or what got me like into UCLA. Um, but we're so obsessed with these top tier schools. And I always share this summary with families when I meet with them and in a lot of our presentations, because I think it's so important. Uh, Challenge Success is a nonprofit that comes out of the Graduate School of Education at Stanford. And in 2018, it's a little dated, but it's still completely relevant. Um, in 2018, they came out with a white paper um, discussing this idea that we should embrace a fit over rankings mentality when it comes to colleges, right? That in their research and in what they found was that a college name the selectivity of a college has nothing to do with student outcomes when they graduate from that college, right? Uh, simply because a student attended a selective university, that does not mean that they have greater life satisfaction or better life outcomes. Uh, and that was a really important finding in my opinion, right? Because it's telling us that what matters in a college experience um, per the white paper is that Students have the best outcomes and find the most level of satisfaction when they are taking advantage of what is offered to them on the college campus, right? When they are finding college that meets their needs and they're taking advantage of whatever it is um, that they have available to them. That's when students really thrive and uh, graduate with a sense of satisfaction and have better outcomes is when they're just simply taking advantage of what's offered to them, whether that college is selective or not. So student engagement is the piece that makes the experience for them, it's not the selectivity of the college. I link here to this summary. So when I send you the slides after tonight, you can read it for yourself and you can actually look at the entire white paper online as well. Um, and that information will be on the bottom of the PDF when you look at this. So let's talk about college fit and why it matters, right? Thinking about that 36% of students who don't graduate um, within that six year time frame. So when we talk to students about college fit, we're thinking about three separate fit factors, right? This is a great way to kind of frame how you're going to approach college searching with your student. First of all, we're thinking about social fit. We're thinking about whether a student is going to feel embraced by their community and comfortable in the environment that they've chosen to go to school at. Um, this includes the location of the school, obviously, the size of the school, athletics, if that's something that's important to them, whether that's, you know, D1, D2, D3, intramural, whatever it may be, um, student organizations, clubs that they might want to be a part of. Is it a commuter campus versus a residential campus? Is there Greek life? Um, I know a lot of students in here who really want that, and we want to make sure that they're finding colleges that have a vibrant Greek life for them. Is there a religious affiliation that you're looking for? Is the diversity important to you, right? But social fit is really important. Um, I didn't link to it on these slides, but I'll, I'll try to remember to send you videos. I do these short presentations for students here at Elise Nagel High School where I'm at. And um, uh, I have short presentations on how students can research social, financial, and academic fit. I'll go ahead and put that in my follow-up email so all of you can share that with your students. Um, but um, we go over specific um, 
tools that students can use to begin researching social fit, right? And that includes social media, going on YouTube to look at dorm tours, um, taking virtual tours, right? Um, getting a sense of what student life is on the school website. But that is something that was going to matter a lot because these students are going to be living there um, for four years if they're going to, if they're planning on living on campus. So it's important that they're finding a campus that resonates with them. Financial fit is obviously very important. Can we afford it, right? Does it make sense for our family financially? Um, using a net price calculator is going to be very important for you. Every school in the U United States who participates in the federal loan program um, has a net price calculator. So I link to a resource here for you to look up any university's net price calculator. And what you'll do is you'll enter in some basic information about your household size and income. And it will give you an estimation of what it might cost to go to school there. Again, this is not a guarantee, but it is a good start for you to begin understanding, um, you know, what it might cost to attend different colleges throughout the country. Um, be careful with early decision as you're thinking about um, financial fit. Early decision is when a student applies early, finds out early, and commits themselves to the university. So there's two different types of early applications. There's early action and early decision. Early action is non-binding. So you're not required to go if you get accepted. Early decision is binding. So if you apply to a school, it can only be one school. If you apply early decision, it is a binding decision and you are required to rescind all of your other applications and commit to that school. The problem with that is unless um, you can afford, let's say, the full tuition, it might not be a good idea because you don't know what kind of financial aid that school is going to offer you. So early decision is financially risky. So unless you feel comfortable, and I Brianne said this in um, a presentation we did recently, unless you feel comfortable writing a, a check for the full tuition, right, cost of attendance, um, early de decision might not be a good choice for you. Um, Big Fish Small Pond is another thing that I talk to students about when it comes to financial fit. Um, for schools, where perhaps your student is a rock star. Let's say their, their academics are just much higher than the average student getting in, and they're an extremely um, high profile student compared to the average student getting accepted into that school. Um, we can think of them as a big fish in a small pond, right? And the benefit of that for a lot of, uh, especially private schools that are more accepting is that your student might end up getting some money for being that big fish in a small pond. They might be very desirable to certain uh, smaller private schools, especially. Right. Um, and in which case they might be offered some more money. So that's something to think about as well. Um, remember that good grades can equal money. Probably not in the case of a public university, a large public university where there's not a lot of money to give. Um, but we're thinking more of our private schools and our smaller private schools. Um, good grades can certainly help get those students scholarships, right? And finally, apply for financial aid. For our senior parents in here, financial aid season is approaching in December. More information from our team to come on that. Um, but it's important that all of us apply for financial aid to make sure that we're maximizing all financial support support um, that might be available to us, okay? And then finally, academic fit. Will I learn well? This is very important as a student is uh, looking for colleges, okay? Do they have the major or program that they might be interested in? And if they don't know what they want to study, do they offer a good variety of majors and programs? Um, are there research opportunities? The UCs obviously have a lot of great undergraduate research opportunities, but so do the Cal States. Um, internship opportunities, is that something your student wants, right? What's the graduation rate of the school? What's the retention rate of the school? A retention rate is how many students are returning for their second year of college. The national average for graduation rate a six-year graduation rate is, again, about 60-something percent. So if we're looking at colleges, you know, it's good to see what their graduation rate is to see how it compares to the national average. The national retention rate is at about 80 percent, okay? So about 80 percent of students nationwide um, are returning to their college for a second year. So something to use as a comparison tool. And then something like student to faculty ratio, right? Just some academic things to consider as you're helping your students um, find their best fit college. Just to let you know, there's gonna be a whole webinar on best fit college um, in the spring for our students. So I do invite you to come with your students to that webinar as well. Um, but then finally for academic fit, we wanna think about credential matching. Credential matching is going to be um, very important as you help your students come up with a balanced list, as Brienne mentioned earlier. So what is credential matching? Um, this is the process of evaluating a student's credentials, so their GPA, their test scores, if you have them, if they're required, um, and comparing them to the average credentials of students getting admitted into the college, okay? This is going to be um, 
again, crucial as we're trying to determine if schools are going to be a good fit for your student. Um, most importantly, for credential matching, we want to make sure that it requires that the student look at the school's acceptance rate, okay? Um, this will help us determine if the school is going to fall into that safety or likely target and reach category. So let's look at that um, with an example, okay? So I use this a lot. So if you've come to any of our past webinars, you've probably seen this. Um, so if you have, I apologize for that, but it's worth uh, repeating. Um, so a likely school, okay? Well, we're not gonna use the word safety anymore. A likely school is where a student's stats are well above or exceeds the average stats of a student getting into that school. So I have a sample student here whose SAT score is an 1100 and whose GPA is a 3.5. For this school's, um, range, this, let's say this is college X, um, their SAT range is an 800 to a 1080. Our student has an 1100, way above average. Schools range is a 2.75 to a 3.3. Our student has a 3.5. We're looking good so far, but we need that last piece. What is the acceptance rate of that school? 70% or higher. I like those odds. We're probably going to get into a school like this. So they're accepting a lot of students and we're well above average. We're feeling good, right? Uh, then we move into target schools, and we want the bulk of our list to be in the target range, right? So this is where our students are in line with the average student getting in, maybe even a little bit higher than that, right? Um, but they're competitive, okay? There's like a fighting chance for you to get in. Um, again, our same sample student applying to college Y, right, whose SAT range is a 980 to a 1200. GPA 3.0 to 3.75. As you can see, our student is right there, just right in the middle 50, um, solidly in there and competitive for admission. But of course, we have to look at the acceptance rate. What is it? For these schools, target schools, we're looking generally in that 50 to 70% acceptance range. Um, now, please keep in mind that all of our students are different. This is just a ballpark estimate for you. Um, but of course, based on a student's extracurriculars and based on the rigor of their course record, right, that will help us determine a truer target um, range for them. Uh, but this is, again, just for you to start thinking about this and is a pretty good guide for most of our students, okay? But with an acceptance rate of 50 to 70%, I'm feeling like this is good. This is a target range for our student. And then finally, we have our reach schools where our stats are maybe lower um, than the average student getting in. Um, this is for highly selective schools, right? Any highly selective school will be um, reachy. So our sample student, as you can see here, is in that lower range, right? And then if we look at the acceptance rate, again, the most important part, the acceptance rate is under 39, it's 39% or lower, okay? Um, and when an acceptance rate falls under 40%, especially, it's going to be reachy for the majority of students. And this has nothing to do with the student. It's the fact that these colleges simply can't accept the sheer volume and number of qualified applicants, okay? So that's something to keep in mind as well. But just as a reminder that acceptance rate is vital as we're trying to determine if this is going to be a good match for our student academically. Now, you might be asking, how do I credential match? Um, and in fact, earlier, Brianne was talking to you about finding the average test scores for a school. So these are some resources that I love to use with students that you can begin to use with your students. These are resources that use trusted data sources that um, I feel comfortable sharing with our families. And at the very top of that list is californiacolleges.edu. This is our district's official college search platform. We got grant funding to pay for accounts for every single student in middle and high school in our district. Um, all of our students should have an account. It links to ARIES and it will actually talk to the Cal State and UC applications. For our junior parents, 10th grade and 9th grade parents and middle school parents, the good news is by next year, this um, platform will be able to import your students' grades into the UC application, which it does not do this year. Um, and of course, the Cal State application, which it does do this year. So it's very convenient and it'll help make their college application process so much easier. Um, but this allows them to search for careers, take career assessments, search for colleges. And this is where they can credential match. As you can see on the screen, um, you can look at any college in the country, not just in California, and you'll be able to see the students or the college's acceptance rate, as well as the average academic profile for the student being admitted to that university. So if you want to find a place to credential match, this is going to be a great tool for you. Other resources that allow you to do the same thing that have similar information would be Big Future through College Board. This has a great filtering tool to find those social um, fit factors. Uh, College Raptor, I love because 
It'll ask you to report a ton of uh, data about the student, GPA, um, test scores, all sorts of things. And it'll actually give you an assessment if it thinks a college is a safety target or likely target or a reach for your student. Um, don't rely on it, but as you know, the final word, but it's just a nice way of kind of getting a sense of what your chances are. And it has this great tool that allows a student to search for a college. And if they're interested, there's another list that says colleges like this college. So if your student finds a college campus that they really like, if they look for that college, College on College Raptor, it'll refer them to other universities that have the same, like a similar reputation, that have the same vibe as that school. It'll also allow them to search for colleges within a certain uh, mileage radius of that school if they're very interested in a geographical area, like Boston, for example. Um, so it's a great way for them to expand their their um, uh, just kind of knowledge of colleges by um, by exposing them to other colleges that are like the ones they know they are interested in, right? And College Express does a similar thing. It's really great for social fit factors. Um, so again, great resources that are all linked here for you that you'll be able to access after tonight's uh, webinar. Now, um, ultimately, we want to aim for a well-balanced list. About 10 schools is a sweet spot, right? Um, of course, I know a lot of students apply to more than 10 schools. If you're applying to a bunch of UCs, that really does kind of blow that number out of the water, right? But um, in a perfect world, 10 to 12 schools is plenty. If we're doing that research, if we're really diving in um, to our exploration, finding 10 strong schools that match our needs that fall into that target realm um, is realistic. That makes sense to me, right? If you're really doing your research. So that would be ideal. But of course, every student will be different. So don't feel bad if your student has a couple more schools or less schools is totally fine too. Um, but we're aiming for a well-balanced list. And that is a list that has a lot of target schools, some likely schools, and maybe a few of those reach schools. Okay. So the second thing that you were most anxious about or concerned about uh, when we were polling you earlier tonight was the senior application timeline. This is one slide, right? Um, and now that I know that that's something that you're, you know, that's on your mind, we can definitely target another webinar um, on this topic for you in the future. Um, but let's talk about the senior application timeline. So between June and October, so June after 11th grade into October, uh, some important things that our, our seniors should have been focusing on is finalizing their college list, right? In a perfect world, I love my juniors to have a final college list by July. That would be great. June is even better. Um, because when they know where they're applying, they can begin working on their college essays if the essay prompts are published at that time. And for many colleges, they they will be, um, because this is the time where they'll begin brainstorming their college essays and writing descriptions for all of their extracurricular activities, which is um, an important part of the application in and of itself. I link here at the bottom to different webinars that we've had on these topics so that you can review them later. Um, but this can help our juniors as they begin to um, think about the end of the year, right? So June through October is a lot of drafting. It's a lot of writing. That's the most time consuming part of the application process is writing all of those descriptions for their extracurriculars and crafting their college essays. Between August and December is when we are actually creating our college application accounts and submitting or and uh, completing our college application. So during this time, they're creating their accounts, uh, the UCs and the common application for a lot of private schools. The common app hosts over a thousand universities and colleges across the country, mostly private and out of state schools. Obviously California private schools are in there as well. Um, and they open in August. So your students as juniors can begin uh, creating their accounts as early as August for their college apps. The Cal States and community college applications open in October of senior year. So that's when they'll begin with those. And the good news is that those are very, um, they're, they're easier applications. Um, they take less time. So it's okay that they're opening a little bit later. Um, the UC and Cal State application deadline is November 30th. It's tomorrow. Um, somebody, my colleague Linda, who's in here with me tonight, said that this is our tax season. And I could not think of a better description for what college counselors are going through right now. But it's certainly our equivalent of a tax season. Um, but the UC and Cal State apps are due tomorrow. And then private and out-of-state schools will have different deadlines, typically in that December, maybe January uh, range. Keep in mind that schools like University of Washington, UW has a November 15th deadline. So we want to be cognizant of our deadlines up front, um, which is why finalizing our college list early on is so important so that we be can begin organizing our college list. Um, 
And then of course, community colleges, we want to submit our applications by January. Um, they have something called freshman, freshman Advantage, which allows students priority registration if they apply by the end of January. So we want our seniors currently to apply to their community college of choice uh, by January so that they can qualify for early registration if they decide to go to a community college. Um, Finally, uh, in December, not finally, in December is financial aid season. This is when we'll be completing our financial aid application, which opens in December. There's a brand new FAFSA and California Dream Act application coming out for um, California residents and more on that to come. We're going to have a whole webinar on this next month. OK, so don't worry about that. But that will be happening for our seniors in December, which is when the new application will roll out. And the deadline is April 2nd. And then finally in the spring, right, there's this huge waiting period, right? There's apply and you're done by around winter break. There is apply for financial aid and then we're waiting. It's a waiting game until about March, okay? And that's when decisions start rolling in for college decisions. And um, during that time, you might be doing some additional college visits um, and comparing financial aid offers from universities so that you can make your final decision on May 1st, which is the national um, deadline to commit to your college of choice. It's called submitting an intent to register in SIR, and that will happen on May 1st, okay? And then a final transcript is gonna be due to your college, usually by July 1st. It might vary uh, depending on the college, but um, I know that the Cal States and UCs would want students final um, post-graduation transcripts by July 1st, okay? So that that's, that's a quick rundown of the application timeline. Um, we do meet with students and families one-on-one. -on -one, so if you have more questions, of course, schedule time to meet with us and talk to us so that we can walk you through this. But this is what it's going to generally look like for our students, okay? So finally, let's talk about your parent, the parent role, right? Um, you're all in here because you love your children. You care about them. You want to support them. Um, so let's talk about a couple things that you can do to really help make this this process meaningful for both of you and um, as productive as possible. So we want you to encourage your students to explore their interests. Like Brianne was mentioning earlier, that love of learning, that encouragement of that one thing that your student wants to get better at or really is already so good at, right? Um, they don't have to do a million things. One or two things is plenty if that's something that they're willing to chase, you know, throughout high school. But encourage them to do that, you know, whatever opportunities you can help them find um, and, you know, support them in their love of a, a particular hobby or interest could really take them somewhere um, they might not have gone without that encouragement, right? Help monitor their A through G status. This is really important. It's, it's all of our responsibilities. It's not just their counselor's responsibility, right? It's all of us. We have to make sure that we know what those requirements are, and we're checking our student schedules and transcripts every semester to make sure that they're taking the required courses and they're getting the required grades, which is a C or higher in all of those courses. Um, they need our help, and we should be on top of this as well, right, to make sure that they're meeting those requirements so that they're eligible to apply. Um, be open to different college options and pathways. You know, they might have a different idea of how they might want to get there and be open to having those conversations with them. I presented to you um, options for pathways into four-year colleges earlier, so think about those options because we don't have to go directly to a four-year college if that's not something that we're comfortable with, right? Um, so just think about what your options are and what makes sense for you as a family and for your student individually, right? Don't compare your students to other students, to other their siblings, to their neighbors, to their cousins, to their, you know, best friend, sister who got into college X, so why can't they get into college X, you know? Um, comparing is, is detrimental to students, um, and we should try to avoid it if we can, because they're not those people, right? And in college admissions, everybody is unique. There's no profile, there are no two profiles that are identical. And, you know, you have to understand that as well as that no student will will be compared to, you know, another student, right? They are who they are and they will be reviewed as, you know, a unique individual and, 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 um, you know, that, that should be the focus is, you know, what they have accomplished and, um, what they have done. And we should avoid that temptation to, um, compare, um, let's help them credential match, right? We had a whole 
conversation or I'd shared with you earlier, um, what credential matching is. So now that you have maybe a more of a sense of that, as your students are coming to you with their college list, take a look at the numbers together and make an informed decision together as to whether you think that's a good match for them academically, right? Um, and then let them take the lead. It's so important, especially if we have younger families in here with, you know, eighth, ninth, 10th grade students, um, encouraging them again to be independent, to communicate with their teachers, to learn how to take the lead a little bit more. Um, the students I find who are the most successful are the ones coming to me, honestly, just by themselves. You know, they're coming to me, um, you know, kind of in charge of their own college application process. They've created their own accounts. They know their username and passwords because they've created the or they've completed their applications themselves, right? Um, so we want them to take the lead because we need them to take that ownership. They're going to be in college, you know, for our current juniors and seniors, they're going to be in college soon. So if they can't do this now, how are they to do it when they're in college and on their own, right? So we want to begin um, encouraging that independence and that um, self-sufficiency as much as possible so that they have that confidence going into college app season to really take this on as, as their project with your support, of course. I link here to a resource for you on Big Future, which is really helpful for parents. Um, let's talk about upcoming events, and we're going to wrap this up for q and I'm sure some of you might have already had to leave because we're a little bit over. I told you I talk so much. I'm so sorry. Um, upcoming events, a really important one is our upcoming financial aid fundamentals webinar. Uh, we will be discussing uh, changes to the financial aid application that are rolling out this year due to some legislation. Um, so if you have any questions about that, senior parents, please come. But of course, any other age um, student you have, if you're a ninth, 10th, 11th grade parent, you're welcome to come as well. There's just, it's never too early to talk about the financial aid application process. So join us on Wednesday, December 13th for that. Uh, we will be offering tutorial support. We do already offer tutorial support every single week at all of our high schools. So the Futurology counselors are on campus. Um, providing presentations and drop-in support to all of our students who are in 12th grade right now. It's college app season, so we really are targeting uh, seniors right now. Um, but in the spring, we'll have a ton of events for 9th through 11th graders as well. One-on-one -on -one appointments, of course. If you can't get an appointment at your site with your counselor because they're booked, please remember that we have an online booking system where you can meet with a counselor online, and that availability is always wide open. So if you can't find an appointment spot with your counselor at your high school site, um, try the online appointment option because there will be more availability for you on that on that platform, okay? And then of course, upcoming webinar Wednesday is coming up in the spring. We have a bunch of really cool webinars coming up for you in the spring. Those will be available to register for after we return from winter break. Um, and again, you'll see here the beginner's guide to college search on March 27th. I'll be diving into how to search for your best college fit with students on that day. Before we wrap up and uh, open this up for q and I do ask that you please complete this post survey. Again, we love to collect data. We want to make sure that our work is effective and we won't know that without data. Um, so if you could take the time to answer a few questions for me at this time, I'm going to give you just two minutes, you know, to scan the form um, or to click on the link in the chat box. I would greatly appreciate if you can complete the post survey for us. Um, again, this data is really important. I'm also going to be asking for your feedback and what other topics you want covered in the future, um, because we want to make sure that we're covering topics that are relevant and pertinent to you right now. Um, of course. So thank you so much for doing that. Again, if you could scan the QR code on the screen, I'm going to put the link in the chat box one more time, not that you need it. I'm just going to annoy you with that a little bit more. And with that, to honor your time, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up tonight's uh, webinar. Uh, I want to thank Brianne for being with us and my teammates, Linda and Angela. Uh, Linda is our alternative um, programs counselor and our other counselor, Angela Gatlin is at Chisora High School. So thank you so much for them for handling the Q&A, which was popping off tonight. Um, we'll open it up for some questions. I think we have a few minutes to answer any of your questions. So you're welcome to put them in the Q&A. And of course, if you don't have any questions and you want to get on with your evening, we totally understand. Thank you so much for being with us. Um, and we hope to see you again at a future webinar.
So um, we have a question. I'll answer it live. Somebody asked what's considered a good ACT score. Um, so I, that that depends, right? There is no good ACT score because every university is so different. Uh, and that's why it's important to look up university stats, right? Because at one school, the, you know, a good ACT score, an average ACT score might be something like 27, right? Out of 36. Whereas at another school, their average ACT score might be 29 to 32, right? And so it's going to depend on the school that you're applying to and the schools that you're looking into, because there's no general, you know, unless you want to say that a perfect score is a, a great score, right? Everybody wants, who wouldn't love a 36 out of 36 on the ACT, but um, it's going to depend on the schools that you're applying to. And no matter what your score is, there will be schools who accept students with ACT scores within your range. Brianne, go for it. Yeah. So the question of does not submitting a test score imply the student did poorly in the test and look upon negatively? It's a great question. Um, so generally I'd say, no, you don't need to worry about this. Um, schools who are going test optional, the reason they're doing that is because they can actually use a more holistic review to review the application and feel that the other parts of the application give them enough to consider in order to um, review that student. So you will see there's some schools that have not gone test optional. And sometimes that's a requirement by the state because they have state requirements related to testing. Um, and so that's because they want that on there. But no, they aren't going to assume the score is, is lower. Um, some students can't test because they can't access test centers. There are still test centers that aren't open in some places. So um, you can feel pretty safe about that. Awesome. Thank you, Brianne. So another question, is the transfer pathway a competitive method of getting into premium universities for pursuing engineering majors, right? So it's funny because, well, first of all, transferring is a great pathway to um, to get into programs, right? Um, especially in the state of California, there is a lot of legislation going on right now that's prioritizing transfer students from the community college into the use of the Cal State system. And so it, it, they have great chances of getting um, into a lot of our great institutions in the state of California, for example, um, if they do well. So you still have to do well when you're in a community college. It's not like you go to community college and get B's and C's and think that you're going to get into, you know, all sorts of different schools. So our students have to do well when they're in the community college and meet the requirements um, that are, you know, set forth by the university that they want to transfer to. Um, but you know, I, I, it's funny because you said premium universities and my thought immediately was the conversation we had about fit over rankings, right? And, you know, this desire to go to what we think would be like a top tier university. Um, I would still encourage students, whether they're transferring or not, to look for colleges that really fit their needs. And if it happens to be a highly selective university that has everything they want, by all means, they should apply. Um, but, but, you know, there are definitely some great programs out there that maybe they haven't even heard of um, that would be really great for them for engineering. But to answer your question, yeah, the students can be um, quite competitive for transfer if they do well at the community college level. They should still be getting involved at the community college level, right? Um, pursuing their interests inside and outside of school. It's the same th thing. Um, but typically transfer rates, acceptance rates for transfer students tend to be higher than the acceptance rate for um, high school students applying and going right out of high school. Um, and some universities, some UCs um, and Cal States have guarantee programs, right, uh, into specific majors. Now, not every UC participating in the transfer guarantee program will have a guarantee into engineering necessarily, um, but some do. So that's something that you can look into as well is the guarantee program between the community colleges and the um, the UCs for engineering specifically. Let's see. Okay. Does, let's see, does the, does the on-campus tutorial help with explaining the advantages of the transfer pathway to students to counter the stigma that might exist? Absolutely, yes. That's such a great question. Um, yes. Yeah, so when we we I just presented to students at Aliso on community colleges, and I talked about the transfer pathway, um, and I will be presenting again second semester on the transfer pathway. We partner closely with our Saddleback counselors, and I believe all of my colleagues have been partnering up with um, Saddleback or independently presenting to students on community colleges and talking about the transfer. For pathway. We are also going to have a community college webinar for all families in the district in spring semester as well. So that's going to be blasted district wide. So absolutely.
yes, Martin, to answer your question, I can include, um, Martin, were you referring to the answers for the pre and post survey? Or, oh no, I think you're talking about the Q&A. If you're referring to the Q&A, I will see if I can, I will see if I can do that. If I have access to that, I will, I will send the Q&A. Yes. I think that's what you're asking. Any other questions? No questions? I'm really surprised. I thought we were gonna get just a ton of questions tonight. No, I think, Jason, I think you're raising your hand. You're, if you have a question, you're welcome to put it in the Q&A. That's gonna be the best way for us to be able to answer your questions. Um, it's like a couple more popped in, right? As you said that, <laughs> prove us wrong. Um, so we have one that says, do a lot of universities have scholarships that are specific to their school? And is it difficult to get them? For example, a child got into University of Arizona and they're wanting him to apply. So, um, so scholarships that are specific to the school, um, yes, 95% of the money that you're going to get is going to come from the college in some form or another. So I know there's like a lot of, uh, gosh, I'm probably dating myself, but there used to be that commercial of that guy that's like, there's millions of dollars of scholarships and you could like get this book. Um, and I feel like that's still pervasive in a lot of, um, and I'm in the same generation as most of these parents. So people feel like, oh, there's all this money swimming around out there. And there is, but most of the money you're going to get is going to come directly from the college. So um, balanced college list will help you do that, like B talked about. So the colleges that are more target or likely for you are more likely to offer you money that's unsolicited, meaning they're just, you qualify for merit money based on your academic or, or applicant profile. Um, and then some schools will have specific scholarship websites. So I would look at each school on your list, go to their scholarship section, see if they have a separate website or a separate application for additional scholarships. Um, and you can apply to those. Um, but I would say it varies by school on whether they're difficult and it varies by scholarship, right? Some will be more competitive um, and some won't require any extra work at all. Um, I know University of Arizona awards merit scholarships to many students without any extra application. So um, definitely check the school's websites specifically. So question, so if a student takes a community college course in the summer uh, while in high school, how does it affect their transcript? So that's a great question. It will impact their college transcript because they're taking college courses. So we want to be mindful that if our students are taking any college courses at Saddleback or IVC or any community college course, that they understand that that's going on their permanent college record, right? And so we want to take courses that they're um, comfortable with taking, that they feel like they can do well in because it does impact their college GPA and their college transcript. So that's point number one. Um, now, point number two is that typically students who take community college coursework at our district do not add that to their high school transcript. So that's not included in their high school transcript, and it doesn't need to be included in their high school transcript, because when they apply to specifically the UCs and the Cal States, they'll be able to list their college coursework separately, and that will be calculated into their Cal State or UC GPA if those courses were taken between 10th and 11th grade, because they use 10th and 11th grade grades to calculate the GPA. Um, and we typically don't encourage students to have their community college courses added to their high school transcript. Community college coursework is actually college level, so it's honors weighted per the UCs and Cal States. Um, if it's transferable, right? For example, for the UCs, they will count it in their GPA. Um, However, when they're added to the high school transcript, they're not considered honors weighted. So it actually lowers the student's GPA. Um, so we don't encourage them to do that. Um, they can certainly take it and it can certainly be counted on their UC and Cal State applications. And for their private school apps, they can send their transcripts to the private schools for that to be evaluated as well. So that's how it's gonna impact their transcript, both high school and college. Um, since you're talking about the colleges, there's a question that was, uh, do colleges have a quota set for admissions from a public versus a private high school? Um, uh, that's a pretty easy answer. So no, um, they don't have a quota. They're looking at the student in the context of their high school, but they are reading for the best fit. Um, so they aren't going to not admit students because they hit a certain number already from that high school. And it'll vary year to year too. So somebody asked why great, you know, they're, um, and I agree, man. Mark asks, you know, there are excellent students out there. 
why aren't they getting into California schools, right? And th that's taking me back to Brianne's numbers that she was sharing with us earlier. So the average number of applications um, to colleges nationwide was what, like 7,000 something? Was mm -hmm. that what? Yep, it was about 7,000. And we're looking at UCs, most of them are close to 100,000 applications. Right. So, um, uh, and most UCs are somewhere like 30% and below in admit rate, um, save a few. So we are looking at, unfortunately, the UC system, kind of most of them falling into that group of 40 schools that I said are kind of in that, you know, 20 to 30% admit rate. Um, and that has, you know, changed over time. Obviously, they've gotten a little more selective. And a few Cal States are more selective, but those are overwhelmingly much more accessible um, for students. Yeah. Okay, I think we have time for a couple more questions. So let's see here. Uh, to follow up on the community college and transcript, if you're taking their foreign language at Saddleback, does that have to be included in their high school GPA or does it um, just check the box? Uh, sorry about my video there. Um, they completed their language requirement. So I think that falls into the same category you were saying before, right? It's a community college course, so you don't need to put it on your high school transcript, but it, it um, but it would still qualify for the A through G um, requirements. Definitely. It'll definitely satisfy A through G. And if they're taking it to both satisfy the A through G and also to meet their foreign language requirement for high school graduation, I believe they can work with their counselor to have it count um, for high school graduation. So you'll want to work with your child's school counselor to make sure that if they're trying to take it to fulfill that foreign language or, or VAPA um, requirement for graduation, that um, you'll want to talk to the counselor to see if you can do that. And I believe that you can. But don't quote me on that. Talk to your school counselor. Yeah, I think you're right. And then the there's a question that's actually very much related to that. that says, my student took Saddleback Art um, for a UC requirement. And does he need to include it in his high school GPA? No, he, he does not. Um, he does not. So he doesn't have to do that. It's going to, it, can, it will be recorded. It will be reported on the UC and Cal State app separately. Um, but again, for specific questions about your child's transcript and as it pertains to high school graduation requirements, please talk to your school's um, counselor about that because they'll be able to give you the most accurate answer for high school graduation. And I know we said we'd wrap at seven. I'll go ahead and since Norman had that question in there before, but if your intended major is impacted like engineering, computer science, is it better to apply undeclared? I actually think it's a very important question to answer. Yes. Um, so Absolutely. good question. <laughs> the answer is not yes. I agree with you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so um, so not typically no, actually, is what I would tell you. Um, so if you are applying to an impacted major and you would look at this school school to school, right? So you're, I wouldn't say universally for any major that you're applying to, you can apply and declared. So look at each school, but if a school has an impacted major or it's a very selective major like engineering or computer science, um, applying undeclared and then trying to get into that major later is going to be an unsuccessful process. <laughs> so if it's already impacted or it's already highly selective, most colleges will tell you that trying to do undeclared and applying later, they actually don't have spots available for you to be doing that because they're taking in those freshmen and they're really looking at the number of spots available in the class. So it can be a gamble. You can certainly do it. You can certainly do it. Um, but it can be a gamble that you would get into that school and then not into that major later. So I usually tell students to think about, do you, are you more concerned about the major or the college? If for you, it's more important to be in the college. Maybe you do a bit different backup major or something, but it's not an end run into the major. Okay, we have one final question. We can't take any more. Okay, so we have one final question and it's already in the Q&A box. Let's see. Um, I have an eighth grader and 11th, but how do I help my eighth grader decide if IB is the way to go? She really wants to, but could she opt to just take more AP classes in high school? Like how much will an IB help her for college? It's a personal preference, right? I, I feel like IB and AP are, are quite different. Um, it, I would... I'm assuming you're then at San Clemente or Capo Valley because they're the only two programs with IB. Um, I think it depends on her, what she wants to do, right? Um, and if the IB program is kind of aligning with what she wants to 
pursue and if the courses are interesting to her, um, you know, having, you know, she could work towards that IB diploma. Um, I don't know if having an IB diploma or being part of an IB program is viewed as being more um, prestigious than taking AP courses. In my experience as a UC admissions reader, I never, you know, that I, I didn't make that distinction when I was reviewing students personally. Um, Brian, what do you think about that IB versus AP? Yeah, so I, I also say it's like a Coke and Pepsi thing, right? So, but they are a little bit different. Like I, I am violently against Pepsi. So, um, so like I, so they are different. Um, IB courses are a little bit different in the way that they are built. Like the curriculum is different. So some students actually don't like it as much. So I would say talking to the IB coordinator at the school, you know, and you don't have to make the decision until 10th grade. So should they have some time so they can take some courses, see how they do in the honors and taking some higher level courses, talk to the IB coordinator, go to the presentations about IB, learn how it's different um, because they might not enjoy the type of curriculum and classroom work that they have to do there. Um, AP is a little bit, a little bit different, but from an admission standpoint, so the IB diploma is considered the most rigorous program you can do because there is the research and the TOK, the theory of knowledge course and the extra stuff you have to do to complete it. However, AP has done some extra stuff with AP seminar and AP research courses and things to kind of match it. Um, and I think you could match an IB curriculum pretty easily by taking a bunch of APs. So. Thank you. All right. And with that, we're going to wrap up tonight's webinar. We've kept you long enough, I think, but thank you so much for sticking uh, with us for this entire time. Brianne, again, thank you so much for your time. And thank you to my colleagues, Linda and Angela, for being with us and answering all the questions in the Q&A. Um, best of luck to all of you. We can't wait to continue supporting your students at um, your high school site. If you have any questions, our contact information is on the screen. I will be sending a recording of tonight's presentation as well as a copy of the slides to all registered attendees this week. So you can look out for that in your emails. Have a wonderful evening and we'll see you at the next webinar.